topic we're going to be going into today is graphic design principles. And on Thursday, I put I did a post diving deep into each of the different principles of design and why you need to know each of them. But we'll go over a little general um, over, overview of all of them. So principles are the graphic design and graphic design. They are the guidelines that you follow when designing. They can be principles like visual balance, um, contrast, rhythm, momentum, um, color, contrast. Any of these principles all pertain um, to how you create designs. And the better you follow these guidelines, generally speaking, the better your graphic designs will be as well. However, it's important to keep in mind that while these principles are there and they're some of the better rules to follow, they're not set in stone. So you'll often find that some of these principles work well for you and some of them don't. It all depends on your customer base and what niche you're in. And then also remember the principles are not the actual elements in a design. For example, they're not the pieces of a design that you use to make a graphic. Instead, they are the guidelines that you use to guide how you use the elements. And it's important to remember the difference between those two just so you don't get a little bit confused on which is which. So the, there's five main principles that I'll go over today. The first principle is balance. Um, and so you might be thinking, okay, well, I'm not standing on one foot while I'm designing, and I sincerely hope you're not doing that, but that's not what balance means when it comes to graphic design. In graphic design, balance pertains to the visual balance. And so if you see here on the screen, I've got three big logos from companies. We have Starbucks, Etsy, and McDonald's. And each of these logos have something in common. There's something that connects all three of them. There's something about the design that works and attracts customer base. And it's not just because of brand recognition or the colors or the layout of the design. The main thing that helps all these logos work really well for their customers is the visual balance. For example, the Starbucks logo, it's symmetrical, it's even, half and half, and that is visually appealing to the customer or to whoever's looking at the logo. The McDonald's logo, same thing, it's also split down the middle, it's symmetrical. In a person's eyes, in your mind, you think, that's balanced, that's symmetrical, I like that. And that's the same thing with the Etsy logo. That is more of a, um, a horizontal balance because the E is standing up, but that same balance is still there. Aesthetically, you think, that looks even, that looks good, I like that. And that's what helps draws people, that's what helps draw people to different logos and different designs. That's why some people will prefer some designs and they won't prefer others. Oftentimes it comes down to the visual balance. Now there's some other big companies that you might think initially, well, they don't really have visual balance in their logos, but it's clear that their logos work. For example, you have the Google logo, you have eBay, you have Amazon, and you have Printify. All of these logos also have something in common. And while they may not be symmetrical necessarily, the Amazon one is pretty close, they still have the same visual weight. We'll talk a little bit more on visual weight when we get to the discussion about colors and even when we get down to the elements of design. But the visual weight of an item is not how heavy it might be when you print it, but it's how heavy it appears to your eyes. For example, the eBay logo. The eBay logo is even in a, um, is even to your mind. It feels symmetrical, even though it's not. For example, the B is not symmetrical with the Y, but the visual weight helps balance both sides and it feels weight, feels even like you're balancing a scale, for example. The same thing with the Amazon logo and the Google logo. The different colors in the Google logo help visually, um, help balance it visually to anybody who's viewing it. And that's important to keep in mind, um, especially when you're designing your own logo for your own Etsy shop or for your own Shopify online business whatever you may be using your logo for, you wanna make sure you have a sense of visual weight because subconsciously you think if it's even, it's good. And that's definitely 
And that's definitely the emotions you want your customers to be thinking when they see your brand. Now, we're not, we're not going to be getting into brand recognition today, um, but that is one thing to keep in mind as you're building um, your brand theme and your branding and your logos, especially when it comes down to your colors and even your font. And just like we were referring to going back again, balance doesn't necessarily mean that something is symmetrical, although that is a good rule of thumb. It instead refers to the visual weight of a design. For example, darker colors feel much heavier than lighter colors. That's why logos like the Printify and the eBay logo work so well. They are visually even in weight, even though they're technically not symmetrical. That's balance in graphic design. Moving on, the next principle is contrast. Contrast is the visual difference between two or more colors or sizes. For example, the text on this presentation contrasts with the dark blue background because the text is white. This is where visual balance can come into play too. It's important to remember that if something is balanced well, it can contrast well. And both of these are really important when you're making designs, especially for products like t-shirts um, or phone cases um, or even tote bags. Those all definitely want to have designs that are balanced well, because the last thing you want to do is be looking at someone's t-shirt and the whole thing's crooked or a mug or a, or a bag. Any type of product that you are using in your shop, you want to make sure that the design on it is balanced so that to your customer, it has a sense of, sym um, of symmetry. And that's really important for good graphic designs. And then going into some examples of contrast. Some, in contrast, you have um, examples both in photography and both in graphic design. Now, for photography, you have examples like colors. For example, the bottom photo, you've got the contrast of the pink and the blue. But then again, you've also got the contrast in the top left photo of the stairs of the movement compared to the simple gray. And then if you go over to the graphic designs, you've got the contrast of the colors. You've also got the contrast of the sizes. For example, in the little explosion graphic I have here, you have the little orange explosion inside of the bigger yellow one. Contrast doesn't necessarily have to be color. It can also mean the size, which is why there's contrast of both the orange and the yellow, and there's contrast of the size of the orange and the yellow. So as you're going forward and making other designs, make sure that while your colors contrast well, sometimes your sizes also need to contrast well, the sizing of your elements. Um, and so that's another thing that you do need to keep in mind when designing. The next principle that we'll be talking about is emphasis. Emphasis refers to the focal point of a design and it's found by consistent branding, colors, and fonts. And this might seem a little confusing at first, but um, let's take a look at a couple examples and I think you'll understand where I'm coming with this. All three of these are famous movie posters. We've got Mission Impossible, Lord of the Rings, and Star Wars. All of these are aesthetically pleasing to look at. Each of them, the colors mix well, the branding looks well, it's got contrast and it has visual balance. Now the other thing that they, all the posters also have is they have a sense of emphasis. Each one of these posters has a focal point. And so what, where are your eyes immediately drawn? Well, if we go back to the screen, your eyes are immediately drawn to the characters, the character, the actors. They're the emphasis or the focal point of a design. And sometimes when we're designing, we assume that the emphasis of a design or the focal point has to be the name of the design. For example, the Mission Impossible or Star Wars. We would think, oh, that's the emphasis. That's the focal point. Not necessarily. It can also be the element of a design that makes the viewer realize what the design is of. For example, in all those movie posters, the focal point is not the name of the movie, but rather the characters. One doesn't have to look for the text on the Star Wars cover to know that it's Star Wars. The emphasis or focal point, which are the actors and the actors' faces, communicates that to the audience. And that's where the consistent branding and fonts come in play. This consistent colors and other elements in the design helps the, helps the viewer realize 
okay, I see this actor, I see this character, I see these colors, I see this font, I see that text. This is all Star Wars, for example. And that's why it's important as you're using the principle of emphasis in a design, don't forget about the value of the background of that design. Sometimes the colors of the background or the colors of the supporting elements can reinforce whatever your focal point is in the design. The next principle we'll be getting into is proportion. And this one seems pretty straightforward. This refers to the sizing of elements in a design. Proportion can both be physically different in size or visually different in size. In size. For example, on the left, we have the target logo. Each of those circles are physically different in size. They, that's the use of proportion. Each one looks has a different size on them, and you, the customer immediately thinks, um, aesthetically, one, you've got an even proportion, and two, you also have a sense of rhythm, which we'll go into in a second. And then the Etsy logo, you have visual and physical weight of the different elements. The Etsy text is both visually smaller than the orange circle, and it's physically smaller. And so it's important as you're working in your designs to not only be employing the use of contrast, but also the potential of the contrast of the proportions of the elements. And so that's why um, it's really important to keep that in mind as you're designing both the contrast and the proportion of the elements that build that contrast. All right, and then the final principle is rhythm, which I just mentioned previously. This refers to a sense of movement in a design. For example, and we'll see the screen in a second, this sense, set of lines has a sense of movement and so does the Amazon logo. Visually, you think there's a movement. Your eyes are drawn to follow the design. Same with the Amazon logo. Your eyes are drawn to follow the arrow, which leads back up to the A. And so as you're designing, especially in logos, um, you really wanna make sure that if you can um, incorporate rhythm, but if you are incorporating rhythm into a logo. Um, make sure that it's pointing towards the focal point of your design. The last thing you would want um, is an element that directs a viewer's eyes away from the centerpiece, your name or your logo. You want everything about your branding. Um, for example, in the Amazon logo, the arrow points up. Now, if that was pointing down, it would direct the viewer's eyes away from the A, which is the centerpiece of their branding. Instead, it points up because that draws the viewer's eyes back to the A in the logo. And so it's important, one, as you're using your contrast and proportion, that you're also taking a look at the rhythm. Is there some way you can incorporate a sense of rhythm into your design? And if so, can you make it where it focuses back to itself? And that's key to using rhythm um, the most in the most effective way um, in graphic design. And so in summary of all those um, principles, the five main principles of design are balance, contrast, emphasis, proportion, and rhythm. Each of these used in sync and used effectively can be used to very to help grow your graphic design and that design's impression on your um, customer audience. So it's important to know what each of these are, how to use them well, and then also how to recognize um, when they're not being used well. Now moving on, we're gonna be going into the elements of design, but before I do so, um, just pause here. If you have any questions, I will have a Q&A at the end um, of the event, but if you have any questions throughout the live, please go ahead and put them in the comments, I will go back and find all the questions and answer them at the end. So feel free to put those in the chat and I'll go back through and I'll answer them in addition to any other questions um, at the end. But now let's move on to the elements. There are eight main elements of design and in reference to elements, these are the actual parts of a design you use to create a graphic. You have most likely used all of these eight elements, so we're not going to spend as much time on them as we did on the principles, but we will go through each of them and see some examples of each. So the eight elements are line, shape, form, texture, space, imagery, topography, and color. 
And so let's go over line first. Lines. These are probably the most basic building elements that you can use in a design, and they can be used in multiple ways. They can be used as a sense of proportion. For example, in the lamp, you've got the lines of the light coming from the lamp, um, and you've got a sense of proportion. You can also use them for a sense of rhythm and motion, for example, in the circle and both um, in the arrow. And then, of course, you can use them in the sense of proportion again as well for the multiple um, circles in a design. And so the line is the basic building block of any element you will ever use to create a design. So it's really important to be aware. Most of us are already aware of using the line in graphic design, but it's also important to be aware of how the line is being used. For example, on the arrow, the arrow is pointing up. In the lamp, it's pointing down. And so you want to be aware of what direction, again, the movement, um, what direction the lines in your design are going, because those that's the key part that directs your customer's eyes. So you want to be aware of how they're being used and in what direction they're pointing. Shape, that's another simple one. Um, you use the lines to build the shape. So the shape is the next step up in your building block uh, toolkit for graphic design. And shapes come in pretty much every literally size and shape so you get there's little um, explanation for this one you guys are probably pretty familiar with this but don't forget about the value of being able to use contrast and sizing uh, proportion when you're using shapes in a design and then moving on you have form now form refers to the sense of a 3d imagery in design for example the coins, the clipboard, uh, clipboard, and the calculator all have a sense of a 3D dimension. And so when you're using the element of form in a design, you're creating a sense of a 3D image on your picture. And this can be a really helpful tool um, when creating um, designs, especially for branding and social media posts, because these tend to get more of, seem to catch more of an audience eye um, than simple flat lays. Texture. Texture is the next element that you can use in a design. This can both be used um, as a gradient. For example, you can use gradients in Photoshop to create a texture like you see on this arrow. And then you also have the textures of, um, of these other elements. And textures should be used sparingly. Too much texture in a design can feel like there's too much going on. And so texture is definitely a piece an element of graphic design that you want to use sparingly and you want to use wisely. You don't want to go overboard on how much texture you use in a design. Space. Now, when it when we're talking about space, this is not referring to outer space. This is referring to the white space that are around that that's in your graphic design. And white space is just the generic term used. It's really just the empty space. For example, in the flower, I mean in the um, feather graphic we have over here, you have the feather in the center and then you have what's called the white space around the feather. It's really important to be aware of where your white space is at in a design because if, you, you, if white space is used well, um, then it can help your customers not feel overwhelmed by your graphic designs, but if it's not used or it's um, or very little of it is used in the design, rather you should say it that way, um, then your designs can feel very cluttered. And so one of my favorite books for graphic design is called White Space is Not Your Enemy. A common trend that we see um, in graphic design is using every bit of space on your canvas. And while that can work for some designs, it's really important to be aware that sometimes having white space is crucial to understanding um, what your graphic design is about. So make sure that you do have space, white space, in your designs. Don't clutter every pixel on the screen. The next one is imagery, and as we saw in our examples earlier from the movie posters or from a social media post, imagery can be used both as a background and as the focal point in a design. Now, I'm finding it's highly unlikely that you will be using necessarily faces of actors in your design, but imagery and the sense of, and using images can be used um, 
to help convey a certain sense of the design. For example, in the Mission Impossible, the imagery that they use helps convey the sense of action and adventure, maybe a little bit of excitement, um, danger. In the Lord of the Rings, it seems a bit more solemn, but still a bit more regal, for example. Um, and so it's important to keep in mind how your imagery is being used. You can use, um, imagery is best used uh, for social media posts and for branding. So it's important to know, one, how much imagery you're going to use in a design, and two, what emotions or vibe your imagery is going to convey to your customers. Topography, and I've seen, some of you may have seen this post before, um, the contrast of different fonts. Different fonts give off different feelings. For example, in the example on the left, I will always find you is written in a very cute, whimsical font. But on the example on the right, it's written in almost like a horror movie script. And both of these images technically say the same thing. They're both written on a notepad, both on the photo, on a desk. But because of the font that was used in the design, they feel drastically different. And that's why as you're using different fonts and topography in your design, um, that you always make sure that your fonts are matching the vibe of your design. So the same thing as we were talking about with the imagery. Make sure the imagery and the fonts have the exact same flow and the same vibe as the rest of your design. Otherwise it can feel too much, There's like there's too much contrast going on. And then the last, um, the last element that we'll discuss is color. Most of you guys are familiar with color. The easiest way to use color in design is following the principles, uh, the five principles that we talked about earlier. If you follow, or at least, um, follow at least the balance and the contrast and the sizing, sometimes the rhythm, um, if you use those principles to help guide your color choices, it can help you avoid from some of those first um, from graphics that where the colors contrast so much that they almost seem like they're moving. For example, have you ever seen yellow text on a red background? Technically the text is not moving, but to your eyes they feel like they're moving. They feel there's too much of a contrast going on. And so it's important as you're using color in a design that you specifically make sure you follow those five principles because um, that will help guide you to make good color choices in your design. So that was the last element um, that you can use in your graphic designs. And the final thing that we'll talk about today is the tools for graphic design. Some different um, tools, whether it's resources or physical books that I've come across over my graphic design journey. One of the most valuable pieces of advice I've ever received is to never stop learning and take that literally. Along my journey, you know, I found several resources that have helped me with learning graphic design, both in how to apply it and how to help grow. And some of these resources are digital and some are physical, so it really just depends what learning medium you prefer. For example, for design programs, I use Photoshop. I would definitely recommend learning this after, after you've played around with graphic design for a little bit or by following a course. For example, white space is not your enemy. Um, most of you are familiar with the name of Photoshop. Some of you might feel a little intimidated by it, and I, I understand that's why you want to make sure you have a good course to follow to help guide you through everything you can do in Photoshop. And so you know what you can and what you can't do, so you know how far you can push your designs. And so if you're going to be looking into Photoshop or Illustrator, make sure you have a little bit of a course to follow. And I do have this book linked down in the original event description if you want to take a look at getting yourself a copy to help with your Photoshop understanding. Canva, probably the most simple and straightforward program that anybody can use. Um, it's online and web-based. You know, there's also an app they have for your phone or your tablet. Um, and so it's really straightforward to use. There is a little bit more of licensing that you have to research um, if you're making designs in Canva. Um, but if you're just getting started into graphic design or you want to get some inspiration, um, definitely check out Canva. Um, and then finally, Procreate, it's a drawing and illustration application for your tablet. And in my opinion, it's the best one that's out there. If you have an iPad and you have $12 to spend, 
make sure you grab this off the App Store. Um, and if your iPad is a little bit of an older model or gener uh, an older model, you can still um, get the um, you can still get the app. You just have to gift it to yourself. Um, but if you have any questions about that, I can explain how to do that at the end. You finally have digital resources, YouTube. Quite literally, you can find everything on YouTube. For example, you, there's free courses and advice, tips and tricks, tutorials, inspiration, and even background music. Now, given that you can find anything on YouTube, it's definitely important to make sure that you take everything with a grain of salt from courses and tips and tricks and tutorials. Take everything with a grain of salt and only um, apply what you think that you can do. Um, but it is a really great resource to finding some ideas and further inspiration on how you can grow in your journey. Um, Webucator and Skillshare are both are two online platforms that offer online courses. I know Webucator used to offer a Photoshop and Illustrator um, course. I believe they still have that up, but I'm not sure. Skillshare um, I know has courses on how to use Procreate, which is the iPad application I mentioned earlier. Um, and then finally, the last resource that I feel is very much underappreciated is the Printify blog. There is so much valuable information that you can find on the Printify blog um, about how to grow your graphic design, niches to tap into, and even SEO advice. So definitely make sure you're looking there somewhat regularly just to take a look at some of their recent articles because they have some really good ones on there. And then of course you have some physical resources. White Space is not your enemy. I will not stop talking about this book because it's just that good. Um, the graphic, you follow along learning new skills in Photoshop as you're completing assignments in Photoshop. Um, this was the one tool that completely changed my understanding of graphic design and what I can do with it. So if you really feel like you're struggling with how to take your designs to the next level, um, definitely take a look at this book. The, like I said, the book is linked in the event description of the first event attempt before the it crashed on me. Um, then the other book that I recommend is A History of Graphic Design. This book showcases different graphic designs throughout history. This is very helpful when you're needing inspiration or if you're targeting a specific historical niche that's currently trending. For example, if you want to hit like a 60s vibe or an 80s, um, having a book that shows you what the different top graphic designs were in that time period can be very helpful when you need inspiration on what to design um, for that. Um, for that product offering. And again, both of these books can be found in the description of the previous event. Um, so just hop over there if you want to see where to find these on 